Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Did you know it's possible to boot a Raspberry Pi off another Raspberry Pi and the client Raspberry needs no SD card, it doesn't need any attached storage, it runs everything over the network talking to the second Raspberry Pi, including the home directories and all the space it needs for Linux, all happens over the network. Absolutely brilliant technology. So today I'm gonna to go through a tutorial to tell you how to set that up. So if you wanna find out more, please, let me explain. So network booting has been around for decades. I remember when I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation, a lot of the remote client uh, workstations we were using would boot remotely over the network. Now the Raspberry Pi has remote boot built into it. It's a, an environment called the pre-boot execution environment. P, the X from execution, E, PXE, Pixie. Okay, and Pixie is a standard way of booting up a client over a network. And the way it works is basically this, the, the Raspberry Pi turns on and it goes, oh, I've got no SD card, I can't boot up. Hey, I'll ask over the network if I can. And then a server, and that's the second board that we're gonna set up, says, yeah, I can help you boot up. And then it starts sending files over to the Raspberry Pi so it can boot up. And we'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. So Pix is a way of booting up one Raspberry Pi from another one or from another device. In fact, if you'd like to see some videos on how to boot up a Raspberry Pi from, for example, a Synology NAS or from a Linux, server or even from Windows or a Mac, do let me know in the comments below and I'll see whether there's enough uh, requests that we can make that video. Okay, so you're going to need two Raspberry Pi boards. We're going to stick with Raspberry Pi 4. Some of this is possible with earlier versions of the Raspberry Pi if you kind of get the right bootloaders. Let's stick with the Raspberry Pi 4. We're going to use one as the server, that's the one that holds all the files, and we're going to use one as the client. Okay, the first thing to do is prepare the client board. Now to do that, you're gonna to need to know two things. The first of all, we're gonna to need to find out some details about the board, particularly its MAC address and its serial number. Now the reason you need those is because when the board boots up, it actually provides its serial number and says, hey, I've got this serial number, can you help me boot up? And it means that on the server, it can have a whole area of disk, whole set of files that are just for that particular board based on its serial number. So it's a way of uniquely identifying the board. I need the MAC address because sometimes looking at some of the log files, trying to debug where have you gone wrong in your configuration, seeing the MAC address appear saying, hey, I've sent out a boot request, for example, is really, really useful. Now, there are a couple of commands you can use to get both of those out. Now, I've listed all the commands that you need in a document over in my GitHub repository, rather than trying to tell you here over a video exactly the commands you need to type in, but you need to get those two. And if you don't want to use uh, commands to get them, when you actually boot up the Raspberry Pi, if there's no SD card in it, there is a screen that comes at the beginning and it does tell you the serial number and it does tell you the MAC address there. One thing to notice is when you get the serial number from the command line, it may have a leading zero. If you have any leading zeros in your serial number, take them off, you need to start with one or upwards. And the second thing you need to do is you need to change the boot order of the Raspberry Pi. By default, it boots up to the SD card. Maybe it'll try at the USB, but we want it to boot up over the network. Now to do that, you are going to need to boot up into Raspberry Pi OS temporarily. So you need to prepare yourself an SD card, boot up into Raspberry Pi OS, 32-bit version or 64-bit desktop, without desktop, doesn't matter, as long as you're running Raspberry Pi OS. Of course, you can also do it over the internet and then install it onto an SD card as I showed in my previous video. Now, once you've got Raspberry Pi OS up and running, go into Raspberry, Raspberry Config, okay, and then go into the menus there to change the boot order. And the exact menu is you go into advanced options, boot order, and then pick network boot. Now here's a really important step that I fell myself in this one. So you've got to understand this. You need to reboot at this point, not just shut down. If you think that's it, shut down, I can move on to the next step, it won't work. You actually need to reboot and come back up into Raspberry Pi OS because only then is the new configuration written to the firmware. So now do a full reboot of your client machine. Now, once you've done that, you can actually now shut it down again and take away that SD card. We don't need it anymore. Now we're just going to use that Raspberry Pi with no attached storage to it whatsoever. Now, step two is to prepare the server. Now, for the server, we're going to use another Raspberry Pi 4. And what I've done is I've actually attached 
uh, an external SSD using the USB uh, 3 port because we're going to be storing a lot of files. We've got a whole other copy of Linux going on there. There's going to be stuff going on and actually it does kind of hammer the SD card and it's better to do it on its own external storage. If you don't want to do that, you can do it on an, XD, an SD card. Make sure you've got enough space on it, obviously, but it will be a bit slower. So if you are using an external uh, storage, make sure it's mounted under slash NFS, Network File System, and you'll see why in a moment. But what I've done is I've got a dedicated SSD mounted under slash NFS just to hold the files for all the remote Raspberry Pis that want to boot off this server. Now, there are two main components to booting up a remote Raspberry Pi. First of all, you need to have Pixie. Pixie says, hey, give me some information on how I can boot up. And what actually happens is a protocol called TFTP, the Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Very, very simple, doesn't even have any authentication. Just like, can I have a file? Yes, here it is. And basically, when Pixie boots up, it says, can I have a copy of the kernel, please? I'd like to boot up into Linux. It goes, yes, you can get it here using uh, TFTP. And it knows enough, it's simple enough to go and get it. So we're gonna need a TFTP server on our uh, Raspberry Pi server, and we get that using DNS mask. Now DNS mask is a full Pixie server, and it's also a TFTP server, so we can configure that. Now I'll show you how to do all the configuration in that document, but basically if you've got that up and running on the machine, then you're gonna have a TFTP server to serve your remote client. Now what you put in the TFTP area is a copy of all the boot files. If you ever look in slash boot, on your Raspberry Pi, it's full of all these really weird and interesting files, many of them .bin, .elf, okay? And they're all basically binary files that you need to boot up the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. And so you need to take a copy of those files, either from a running system, in fact, you can take it from the very server itself that's running, because it's also a Raspberry Pi 4, and we've got a Raspberry Pi 4 we want to boot up, so it's exactly the same files, copy them into there, or you can download an image file from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, unpack it, take the files out of there. The instructions are again all in my GitHub repository. Bottom line, the TFTP area needs to be populated with the boot files for the Raspberry Pi, and you actually end up having one set of directories for each of the serial numbers. So if you boot up, let's say 10 of these, they all have their own boot up area. And of course, that means also you could try other models of Raspberry Pi or in the future, when other ones come out, they all have their own area with the right boot files in it. And the second thing you need is an actual Linux installation for the remote client. And that's where we use NFS, the network file system. So basically what happens is when the kernel boots up, it says, well, where am I gonna find my root file system? Where is slash bin? Where is slash home? Where is slash var? Where am I gonna get all this stuff from? Because, hey, well, actually, you're not gonna get it on the SSD. You're gonna find it over the network. And there's a special version of the kernel that understands to mount a root filing system over the network. So our slash NFS area will have subdirectories, each again based on the serial number for that particular board. And underneath it is a full Linux distribution, slash etc, slash var, slash home, slash bin. It's all there. And what you do is you copy that again, either from the running server, because it's a Raspberry Pi 4, you're trying to boot a Raspberry Pi 4, so you just say, hey, copy my main uh, files here over to this area. Or again, you can download an image file, unpack them, and extract them from there. Again, all the instructions on how you copy those over are in that GitHub repository. So basically what you end up with under slash NFS is a, a full Linux distribution, fully installed with all the files that it needs, including the home directory, which will then be served to the remote client over the network file system. Now, a couple of other things that you need to do, again, these are all documented inside of my GitHub repository, is you need to export those directory. So you need to export every time you create a new uh, boot up for a new board, it needs to be exported. So the NFS says, hey, this directory is available for this serial number. Another thing you need to do is you need to change the command line parameters that get passed to the board, the client board, so that it knows to find the root directory on a remote server and not on itself. And the final thing you need to do is you need to make sure that the slash etc slash FS tab so that's the file system table that's on the, the ins, inside of that NFS directory for each board actually says, don't try to mount the SD card, mount your root partition over the network. So those are three files that need to be changed. And again, all the documentation is over there in my GitHub project. In fact, what I've also done is I've written two 
uh, shell scripts that kind of take all of the hard work out of this. The first one is a kind of a preparation one that basically installs the TFTP error, it makes sure the NFS server is installed, it installs DNS mask, it creates the files that you need for all that lot to work. And then the second one is an add board. So you basically say, add this board with this serial number and it will make sure there's a whole copy created for it, both in TFTP and inside NFS. It will fiddle with the FS tab, it will fiddle with the exports file, it will do all that stuff so that hopefully if I got the scripts right and I did a bit of testing on them, then basically you can say, here's a new board, here's the serial number and you plug it in and then it will just boot up because those scripts take all the hard work out of them. Do give them a try. Love to hear your feedback. If I've got mistakes in it, if it can be improved, hey, let's do that open source, you know, let's just change, tell me what you want me to change and we'll have a look at it. And the final thing then is once you've got the NFS server and the TFTP server, your Pixel ser Pixie server all up and running, then basically reboot it to make sure everything is okay. And then plug in your uh, remote board and it should uh, boot up. Now there are a few commands that I also list in the GitHub documentation to allow you to see the kind of the messages that are going back and forth. It's useful looking in slash var slash log slash daemon.log if there's a dns mask.log file because there you can see the different interactions to what's uh, going on. But basically once you're done you should have a remotely booted file. Now of course this isn't going to be as fast as if it's using local storage because it's doing everything over the network. However, I did some testing and let's say if I wanted to create a file that is like 500 megabytes uh, in size, if you do that locally on an SSD, it might take two seconds. If you do it over NFS, it might take 11 seconds. So it is five times faster, but it's not like it takes three minutes or something like that. So it is usable. Uh, and so it is actually a good way of getting uh, all these uh, Raspberry Pis built up. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, lots of different reasons. Let's say you wanted to build a small cluster. One good way, rather than preparing all the individual SD cards, is to boot up over the network. Let's say you wanted to build a render farm, a distributed compiling setup. Again, booting up over the network is really good. Or if you've got a remote thing, let's say you've got a, you know, a, a, a security camera or a weather station that you've connected up somewhere in your house. Well, if you use power over Ethernet, and I've got a video on how you use power over Ethernet for a Raspberry Pi here on this channel. In fact, that's what I did on my test board. It's got the power over Ethernet hat on it. So you just plug in the, the Ethernet cable and it boots up. So imagine you've got a Raspberry Pi connected to a camera or to some sensors. You put it in a nice little plastic container and you've got it doing something. And all you do is plug in the Ethernet cable with power going over it and it will boot up over the network, talk to your remote server and then actually uh, off you go and it's all running. So that's a really good way of really doing remote stuff without next time you want to fix something or upgrade the operating system or the next time you want to, you know, there's an SD card that you go up into your tree or up into the roof of your house or wherever and try to change it. No, this all happens over the network. So as long as there's a cable connected to it, it will work. Okay, that's it. As I said, check out the documentation in the GitHub. This really is a fun project and I had a lot, a great time getting this all up and running and learned a lot about remote booting, NFS, TFTP all in the way. So if you want to give it a go, please do and tell me about the results that you have in the uh, comments below. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, hey, stick around, subscribe to the channel. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter at Gary Explains and I also have a newsletter. Go to GaryExplains.com, type in your email address, you will get the email but you won't get any spam. Okay that's it, I'll see you in the next one.